Well, good morning, everybody. We are thrilled to welcome you to the 2016 Positive Business Conference. Uh, and we are delighted to be able to host you here uh, at the Stephen M. Ross School of Business. It's an incredible audience. Uh, the conference organizers gave us some details on yeah. who's here, mm -hmm. and it's really incredible. So we are going to read out where participants are from. So we have someone from Canada. We have people from Colombia. We have Egypt and Finland, France, Germany, Japan, Netherlands, the UK, and the US of A. Did we miss anyone? <laughs> Ravi and I will say we got missed, because yeah. I'm from Ireland, and Ravi? I'm from India. So. <laughs> <laughs> Also, our largest group is from NSF International from here in Ann Arbor. Let's give a shout out to our friends from there. So we know everyone is here. It really cares about positive business and how we live it. Um, and we really have got a phenomenal lineup on the stage, yeah. right? Really phenomenal. But we know as important as who comes up on the stage are the people here in the audience. You guys bring so much energy, so much knowledge, so much inspiration to this conference. We really couldn't do this without you. And you're a huge part of the conference. So we hope over the next two days, you can get to know each other and learn from each other in lots of different ways. So kind of with that in mind, Ravi and I are going to introduce ourselves to each other, even though we actually do know each other. So just to do some positive connections. And we're going to ask you, after we're done, to meet someone you've never met before. So you NSF people, you're going to have to break up a little. <laughs> OK? So hi, I'm Kathy Shakespeare. Hi, I'm Ravi Anupindi. What brings you to this conference? So uh, I'm actually an accounting professor. I know you're shocked by that. Uh, <laughs> accounting and positivity, right? But um, I'm here because I really care about regulation and improving regulation, actually. And I think a lot about how we can make it better. And I think a lot of the aspects of what's in positive business can help. And I think that actually most recently, I'm, I've done, as Ravi knows, a fair amount of international traveling. And recently, I've just came back from London from working with the international accounting standard sellers in helping them understand how a new regulation got implemented and whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. How about yourself, Ravi? That's pretty heartening, you know, because when I thought, Kathy from accounting, you know, what does accounting <laughs> got to do with positive stuff? And I just kind of wonder, you know? Hey, uh, I'd like to point out, as you're going to find out, my friend here is from Ops, so... Right, right. So, <laughs> so I'm Ravi Anupindi. I'm a faculty in the technology and operations uh, area, and my uh, research and teaching interests are in global value chains, and particularly interested in uh, social and environmental responsibility in the extended value chains, the role of value chains in economic development, and how... So I'm interested really in this conference from two perspectives. One is how the positivity or positive organizational culture extends beyond the organizational boundaries in the extended value chain, but also in terms of what happens in the extended value chain, how does that influence the internal organizational culture? So both ways, there's a bi-directional stuff. So that's where I come from, and we're really looking forward to the various sessions uh, uh, in, the, in the next two days. So I think if an accountant and an ops guy yeah. can think positive business is important, I think every single person in this room can probably view it that way, right? Yeah, I mean, the way I see it, right? I mean, ultimately, you can talk all positive, but if you've got to do this stuff, it has to be ops. And, <laughs> and then, uh, and hey, then, hey, and then somebody's, hey. got to, and then somebody's got to measure it. <laughs> and that's accounting, right? Otherwise, it's all talk anyway. And I'd like to think accounting is at the beginning of the alphabet, A. We're number one. Yeah, and you know, operations, you know, we are in the technology and operations area, but in our field has historically been called OM, operations management, which is really a mirror image of MO. <laughs> right? So, anyway. So we'd like to give you a couple of minutes to introduce yourself to someone who you've never met before. Remember, my friends over here, breaking up, right? And uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes. Let's find out about why people are here and what you want to learn from this conference. All right, you might want to stand up and move around.
please. So, wow, that was pretty impressive. I have a feeling this is the start of a pretty amazing dialogue over the next two days. And I know everyone in this room has lots to contribute. What do you think? I, I agree, you know, I mean, uh, in the next few days, uh, really we're gonna, uh, looking forward to learning a lot. And we have, you know, practitioners as well as uh, academics. And if you know, Ross is <clears throat> all about leadership and thought and action. So uh, we're looking forward to the practitioner perspective in terms of how to, how to implement these things, the action perspective and faculty coming in and providing the thought leadership. So we hope that in the next two days we will integrate these two perspectives as we go through between sessions and faculty workshops, et cetera. Kathy and I will do our best to provide the connections and structure because we need a framework to understand all the stuff that you're gonna see in the next two days. Uh, so to provide a framework and structure the ideas that we are hearing uh, from the range of speakers, and we'll try to help you do the same as you go along. In your notebook, uh, you probably can start writing some of the things that you see. Uh, <clears throat> Unfortunately, Dean Davis Blake is unable to be with us this morning. But we're delighted to have our associate dean, uh, Lynn Wooten, join us for the program. Lynn will share how Michigan Ross defines positive business for the next generation of leaders as part of our mission and strategic direction. Please uh, help me in uh, welcoming uh, Lynn to the st uh, stage. Good morning. I've known Ravi and Kathy for many years, but I did not know that both of them have another calling to be comedians. <laughs> so thank you for creating that positive energy. As Ravi stated, Dean Davis Blake is traveling and couldn't be here. But on behalf of the Dean's office, I'd like to welcome you to the third annual Michigan Roth Positive Business Conference. When this conference began in May of 2014, one of the key points we made was to solve the world's toughest problems. We need business if we're gonna solve them. And not just business as usual, but positive business with a capital P. You may ask sitting in a business school, um, when I asked my daughter and I talked to my 14-year-old about positive business, why is this important? Well, here at Ross, we believe business more than any other societal entity has the power to impact millions of lives. It's in an instant, in our neighborhoods and around the world. Therefore, we have a clear purpose to empower future business leaders and current business leaders, such as yourselves, with not only the drive to make a positive difference, but the tools, the best research in the world, and the experience needed to actually execute this difference. So many times my undergrads at 20s will ask me, what is positive business? At Ross, we know that there are a number of definitions, but for me, it's about three questions that must be answered, understood, shared, embraced, and act upon. One, how does business create economic value? Two, how do we create great places to work where people are thriving and want to get up every day and come to work? Especially since many of us are going to live to be 100. <laughs> and then the third one is how to be a good neighbor in the communities that we live in, in our nation, and in the world. Now this wouldn't be Ann Arbor or Michigan if we didn't have a sustainability story about trees. And so in a minute, I'd like to share a tree story with you. And this story, you're going to see a video in a few seconds when I let them um, tell them to play the video, really exemplifies here at Ross how we apply the principles of positive business. And in particular, as you're watching this video, I want you to reflect upon how can we use positive business as a change trajectory to transform organizations? How do we use positive business to lift up organizations, individuals, and communities? When we talk about lifting up, we think about excellence in academic programs, stewardship of resources, and being members of society. And so now we're gonna show this tree video. To set the stage, there was a tree that was dying, and it was gonna be trussed by the construction of our new building. And we didn't know what to do. Maybe a normal path or maybe a negative deviant path would say, give up, cut it down, and not think about another way. 
but we thought about another way, and this video will exemplify it. It's been here a long time, here a long and time. we kind of knew that right from the beginning because it's such a gorgeous tree. We knew it had been around a while, and obviously from the start, the thought was to preserve it, uh, and then when we knew that might not be possible to do, then we thought, well, what can we do to honor it? And uh, from there, the story kind of took off. In our initial drawings, we weren't going to have to construct into where the tree was. Uh, the realities of budget were such that we couldn't do as much on the far end of the complex as we had originally hoped. And for the first time it hit us, we're going to be building awfully close and maybe even on top of where that gorgeous tree is. As we vetted it through the community, clearly it was a preference to transplant it rather than to destroy it. Uh, and then we started thinking, wow, this sounds a little bit like a purely Michigan thing to do, which is to you know, kind of preserve the history and plan for the future and provide an education for the whole community as we did it. We've been in business since 1976. We've probably moved 25,000 trees. Of those, several thousand of them were larger than this tree. Our historical success rate's about 98%. So in terms of whether it's gonna live or not, I'm very confident that it's gonna be you're perfectly fine. Environmental design kind of rose to the top pretty quickly as one that had done this type of tree before in our environment with success and was really anxious and willing to work with us in whatever we needed to do to make it happen and be successful. We'd like to come in as early on as possible to root prune the tree. What that does is that allows the tree to regenerate new feeder roots off of those clean cuts so that when we come back later and move the tree it's already begun to regenerate roots and so it's, it's kind of healed in place, if you will. Now it's moving week. We will begin inserting airbags beneath the outside edges of the pipe platform that will allow us to very slowly lift the tree up enough so that we can then insert a multi-axled set of trailers that are run, run by remote control. And then we will slowly drive the self-propelled vehicle up and out of the hole. Some folks were very much for this to happen. Some folks, not so much. Yeah, so we tried, tried to be sensitive and allay everybody's concerns relative to moving the tree. We realized that there's an important part of our community that wants to preserve our history, and this tree is a part of our history right here in the middle of our complex. Uh, we talk here at Ross all the time about action-based learning being one of our pillars of education. And so to go through this process and say, students, this is how this works in the real world. You're gonna have a lot of people who are gonna have stake and interest, and they're a part of your community, and you have to respect them. More so than any other project I've ever been a part of, I feel like I'm a living part of this community, experiencing it, delivering it, and I could think that I will come back in 15, 20 years from now, look at that and be able to talk about it and still feel really, really proud about what we've done here. As you may have concluded, the tree story was a huge effort. Over time, it was something unique that had never been done, but it produced great results. The tree story is also an analogy to organizational change and using positive business practices as a vehicle. Like the Ross School, the tree was under nutritional stress and was threatened by external conditions. While many said, chop it down, and there's nothing else we can do but throw up our hands and wait for destruction of this tree, we took a different and innovative approach, a positive business approach that saved the life of the tree and brought our community together. The careful preparation and lifting of the tree mirrors our own careful examination of changes in organizational life. Each day we wake up as leaders practicing positive business and must ask ourselves, what can we lift up? What do we have to move and how are we gonna get there? And ultimately, through answering these questions, we create flourishing in organizations. Moreover, the tree is symbolic of four components that we think is key to learning and what we do here at Ross. One is develop a mission. What does it mean to develop a mission when you practice positive business? It's honoring the past. It's building on our strengths. It's understanding competition. Yes, even in academia, we have competition. It's creating distinctiveness in the marketplace. Developing a mission also entails articulating a vision and a path for execution. It's speaking to both internal and external audiences as we had to do with the Cree move. And it's having a statement that articulates who we are and what we do.
For example, at Michigan Ross, we develop leaders who make a positive difference in the world. Number two, what did we learn from the tree and how do we try to practice here at, here at Ross? If you come, they will build it. What does that mean for leaders? It means creating great places to work, providing our stakeholders and especially our employees with resources. But maybe just as important, it's having them do something great together, inspiring others to build together something beyond themselves and beyond the organization. Number three, here at Michigan and in many of your organizations, it's the team, the team, the team. This is an athletic town in addition to being a tree town. But we do know that in athletics, sometimes the team is a fixed size. But many in our organizations, we're always having to say, how can we expand the team? How do we create amazing teams? At Ross, we use teams for everything, everything from trees to action-based learning to research projects to curriculum transformation. And maybe the fourth component of our story is it speaks to the power of hope. When there is no hope, it actually eliminates neutral pathways. But if you instill hope, what do you do? You inspire people to think, to be more creative, and to be more energized. And you create abundance in organization lives. So maybe this is what this conference is about. So in conclusion, our hope is that you do three things to, while you're here. One, engage and inspire. Being here among your global peers who share your passion for thriving workplaces through positive business and should share your desire to improve your ability to transform organizations, teams, energize you personally and professionally. Secondly, one of my favorites maybe, build your toolbox. Take advantage of all the mind power in this room between our guest speakers, the attendees, Ross faculty members. There is enough mind powers and tools to fill every library in this university, and there are lots of libraries here. <laughs> you have leaders at your disposal who have written books about positive business. You have people who practice positive business every day. And their goal will to be give you homework. Yes, homework. Complete your assignments and think about how you can take these tools back to your organization to bring more positive practices. Finally, think about how you're being self-empowered to make a real impact. That can, impact can be large, medium, or small. What are you going to go back and implement? What's the one new strategy, the one new action? What's the movement you're going to make? What will be your tree? We're counting on you to keep this going. It's up to you to make the change you want to see to be the change you want to be. In other words, every day we're honored, each of us, to get up to be leaders to make the change we want to see. Thank you for joining the conference. Wow, we are proud of our tree. Have you seen it out there? Yeah. It is a beautiful tree, and it's such a symbol for us of what positive business means. So in your uh, conference books, you, we have left a, kind of a space for you to be able to take notes uh, every, after every speaker. So I suggest that you might want to spend a couple of minutes reflecting on what Lynn said and thinking about how it applies to your organization. What's your tree, right? What, what is your challenge? What do you want to take away from this conference? So spend a couple of minutes, and we'll probably do this at the, at the various points through the conference so that you can kind of start to reflect and think about what your big takeaways might be.
It's already a lot to reflect on, right? Please, before you leave, make sure you go look at our tree. It's a pretty cool thing, right? Anyway, I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Vic Strecker. He's a, a behavioral scientist and a professor here at the University of Michigan. He has such an impressive bio that I'm actually going to have to read a little bit, so I apologize. He's the Director of Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship here um, at the School of Public Health. Uh, he's a founder and president of Jewel Health, which sounds like a phenomenal organization. Uh, Jewel Health is a digital health solution company Company that integrates the science of purpose in life, advanced smartphone and biometric technology, and big data analytics to improve well-being, helping users become better researchers of themselves as they develop and align daily with their purpose in life. Wow, right? Uh, he's also the author of several um, books. Uh, in a variety of formats, including a graphic novel um, targeted to, as Vic apparently claims, human beings, which I think is awesome, and his readership ranges from prisoners in the Los Angeles jail system to MBA students at top-tier schools. <laughs> so please welcome Vic to the stage. Thank you, Vic. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me okay? Mike is working okay? Great. Um, so, a few weeks ago, I was reading this headline that suicide rates have increased 24% in the last 15 years. Now, the first thing I was asking myself when I saw this was, why isn't this in all the media? Why doesn't everybody know about this? If this were something like a cancer increases in the last 15 years by 24%, People would be going insane about it. But this is suicide. Why are people just, just kind of tucked under the rug a little bit? I don't understand why. The other thing is I just wanted to ask why. Why have suicide rates increased? I mean, we have more prosperity than we ever have. I, I'm not quite sure why that's going on. And it turns out well over 100 years ago, this guy, Emile Durkheim, the father of modern sociology, asked the same question and wrote this book called Suicide. In this, he started saying, basically, as we start modernizing, as we move from more of a feudalistic society into this modern industrial society, we're going to start becoming increasingly disconnected from our families, from our countries even, from all sorts of things. And as we do, we'll suffer what he called alienation and anomie, real disconnection from society. And as that happens, we'll start becoming depressed and we'll start killing ourselves. And he mapped this out pretty carefully, and it was really a, an amazing initial treatise on the sociology of suicide. And this is what he kind of started concluding toward the end of his, uh, of his book. He said, he must feel, of course he uses he because he's a he and it's 1800s, he must feel himself more in solidarity with a collective existence which precedes him in time, which survives him and which encompasses him at all points. This is what he was concluding. If this occurs, he'll no longer find the only aim of his conduct in himself, an understanding that he is an instrument of a purpose greater than himself. But then he started asking, and this is toward the end of the book, he said, well, what groups are best to do this? How, what organization should we be connecting with the most? He said, well, how about politics? How about our political society? How about our country? Should we all rally around France or England or the U.S.? He said, no, no, that's, it's too big. It's too big to really connect very effectively. How about religion? Well, he said at this time in France, I'm not sure. I don't see this as being the connecting point. Not even the family? Really? No, he said not even the family because the family is starting to move all over the place now. They're not, you know, in the same villages. So he said, Beside the society of faith, of family, of politics, there's one other of which no mention has been made. The occupational group or corporation. This he said in 1897. And by the way, he was a socialist. <laughs> it's amazing. He said, in fact, indeed, 
They are made up of individuals, these corporations are made up of individuals attached to one another by no bond and only superficial intermittent relations, even inclined to treat each other as rivals and enemies that, than as cooperators. But once they have had so, I'm so dyslexic, but when once they have so many things in common when the relations between themselves and the group to which they belong are thus close and continuous. Sentiments of solidarity as yet almost unknown will spring up and the present cold moral temperature of this occupational movement, still so extreme to its members, would necessarily rise. Isn't that amazing? Over a hundred years ago, he starts writing about what this conference is all about, which is having a purpose greater than him or her self, or themself. And now in modern times, the Gallup poll in 2013 finds that seven in 10 American workers are not engaged or actively disengaged in their work. You all know this, or you probably wouldn't be here in the first place. And we know that this disengagement relates to absenteeism. And then Gallup concluded that managers can actively limit disengagement and poor well-being by focusing on an organization's mission and purpose. Now, by the way, I'm in a school of public health. I am interested in this conference on positive organizations for public health reasons, actually, not for business reasons. I actually think, just as Emile Durkheim says, that the occupation that you work in, the place that you work in, the corporation you work in, the small business you work in, is one of the most important places to build a healthier lifestyle, and overall health and well-being. So by the way, now, over the last 10 years, we found that having a purpose in life is important to longevity. People who have a strong purpose in life live far longer. In fact, this is better than, if you have a low purpose in life, it's like smoking two or three packs a day of cigarettes. I mean, this is a really big deal. Having a purpose in life reduces your risk of stroke, of heart disease, of diabetes, of sleep disturbances, of Alzheimer's disease. Seniors who have retired, if they lose their purpose, they are 2.4 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease seven years later. Now, the scientists in this group may be going, oh yeah, sure, but that's because people with purpose have higher SES, they're more educated, they have this, they have that. Not true. Not true, it turns out. I could go on and on about this, but it turns out that, first of all, after statistically controlling for the kitchen sink, age, race, gender, income, education, health status, health behaviors, this still comes out. Very important. Purpose in life even gives you better sex. I mean, can we go home now? I mean, this, is this awesome? This is like, if this were a pill, this would be a multi-billion dollar pill. If I invented this pill, I'd be a Nobel Prize winner, right? It's incredible. My own purpose in life is this, to enjoy love and beauty. That is my personal purpose. Very hedonistic, isn't it? And it is. I love nice things. Great. To be an engaged father, husband, and grandfather. That's transcending, because I'm interested in other people. To teach every one of my students as if they are my own daughter. And by the way, it's so fabulous to see some of my students here. It's so cool. Thank you. Um, and to have an impact on the well-being, on the research of well-being, to, and to be an engaged leader. That's a lot of stuff. Also to help one billion people develop purpose in their lives. Because I think increasingly we're living in a narcissistic world that focuses more on what the Kardashian sisters are doing than what our neighbor is doing, or what our coworker is doing, or what they're up to. And I think we will kill ourselves now, and that's one of the reasons we're killing ourselves, and it's one of the reasons that we suffer from depression increasingly, because we live in this insane, narcissistic, selfie world, and we have to get out of that somehow. Now, this is a very big, hairy, audacious goal, right? Now, most of you in organizational psychology know that if you set a goal, it works far better, you achieve 20 or 30 percent more behavior change than if we just say, do your best, no matter what it is. But a goal that's deeply valued, deeply valued, I'd call a purpose. So this, there's goals that I've set around all of this. Now, in order to achieve those goals, such as trying to be a good teacher to my students, needs a lot of energy and a lot of willpower. I view my own health as being a boat. I view my body as a boat. And I need wind in my sails. But you know what? Wind in your sails is not enough. 2,000 years ago, Seneca said, you know, 
It doesn't matter how much wind is in your sails if you don't have a harbor. What he's saying basically is you need a lot of energy, but you better have a purpose. We all know people who have a lot of energy in their lives and no purpose. What's the scientific word for that? Oh, annoying. <laughs> Those people are annoying, right? Oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, oh, fine. Yeah, you're annoying, go away. We tell little kids who have all this energy and no purpose, no direction, no willpower, we say, you have ADHD, we have to give you a drug. That's like putting an anchor on their boat, right? Oh, that's the easiest thing to do. Just put an anchor in their boat. They're going, oh, God, I really got to go. Well, really, what you need to do is give them a purpose, at least as a first line. Before you give them a drug, before you give them an anchor, at least try to develop some direction in their life and see what happens. That might be kind of awesome. And then you also need some willpower. Now, by the way, in order to have more willpower or rudder, and now, by the way, psychologists view both energy and willpower as muscles. They can be strengthened. They can be fueled. They can be depleted and they can be trained. Now, how do we train and fuel and strengthen this? Well, first of all, every single day for me, I try to sleep well. I meditate every single day. In fact, if I don't meditate, I don't give myself an alcoholic beverage at the end of the day. So I am the best meditator you have ever seen because I love drinking. I really do. I mean, once I actually did forget to drink and I meditated, I was like upset. So. <laughs> I walk to work every day. It's about half an hour each way. To Jewel Health, it's 50 minutes, so that's a lot. I try to be creative as I can, and I try to eat well. And I won't get into detail about all these. That's not the subject of this. But what I try to do is sleep, become more present every day, active, creative, and eat well. In other words, I try to give myself space if I can. And I don't think about space in terms of reducing my risk of hypertension. I don't care about hypertension. Do you? You really, oh, I'm hypertense. No, I don't think so. I mean, not most people. My cholesterol's high. Those people, the scientific term, I think, is boring. Oh, here's my cholesterol numbers. You know, can I talk to anybody else in this conference, please? And then, you know, if you have those, I don't, you know, this is fine. We can scare people in public health. We're so used to scaring the crap out of people, aren't we? And then, of course, we scare people with this, this idea of, if you don't change, you will die, right? Die, 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 die. Mark Twain once said, I don't care about dying, I care a lot about not living. I really want to live a big life. Isn't that more cool than doing any of these things? So anyway, I think that what's much more important is having a purpose in your life and using these behaviors, uh, using purpose as a motivator to change these behaviors and thinking about having more wind in your sails and a strong rudder. And then I think about these behaviors being really related, because they are. Over the last five years, I've done a lot of work in this, and it turns out that each of these behaviors have been shown to give you more energy and give you more self-control. But why do I want more energy and self-control? So that I can be aligned with my purpose every day. Aristotle said, it's not just about having purpose. Now I can go to Disney World. It's more about being aligned with your purpose every single day. It's not just, oh, I have a purpose, good. It is really, okay, here's my purpose. It's to teach every one of my students as if they're my own daughter. Uh-oh, wow, today I am pooped. How am I going to do that? I've got 15 students that I'm going to see at office hours. How am I going to maintain engagement with them? That's not simple. So I have to do these things. Now, by the way, if I am stressed, if I'm abusing substances, drinking too much, or doing whatever, uh, these behaviors help me control that as well. So in other words, how could we build a purpose pill? I'm in the public health area. I'm very interested in what occupational groups can do to build what's called wellness. I hate the word wellness, by the way. I like well-being. So in fact, in our field, wellness is really shifting to well-being. There are other things that need to shift as well. In the 1980s, an accelerometer, you know, fuel bands, Fitbits, you know, all those things, that's part of a triaxial accelerometer. One of the first triaxial accelerometers was built for an ICBM missile. It was about that size, and it weighed about as much as a small refrigerator, and it cost a half million dollars. Now, of course, it costs a quarter, and it's dinky, right? We used to have these, right? These things called telephones. Now we have these, right? We had these things. By the way, now we have these. <laughs> we have in the field of wellness things called health risk appraisals. Health risk assessments or health risk appraisals are used in over 80% of large companies. 
They ask you things like, do you smoke? Do you drink too much? Do you eat right? Do you buckle your seatbelts? And then the feedback is, oh, you should quit smoking. <laughs> oh, thank you. I never heard that before. Wow. That's, oh, wow. And if you don't quit, you'll die. Really? Man, now I'm going to quit. Jeez. Uh, perfect. God, thank you. Thanks for telling me that. And now what do we have? We have health risk appraisals. We have the same damn thing, only on the internet. Oh, how nice. Oh, we're so modern in public health. Oh, gosh. It's like PowerPoint slides. Jesus. So again, this is my big, hairy, audacious goal. But you know, other people can have purpose like this. And, and one of my goals at the bottom, you can see, is to help a whole bunch of people try to develop more purpose. And that's why I created Jewel Health. Jewel Health is a company that is trying to help people develop greater life engagement, greater purpose in their lives. And I'll talk just a little bit about it. This is not a sales pitch. I'm very sensitive to that, so please don't view it that way. What I want to do is show you an example of what I think is the future in our field of public health and how it could be really engaged with the business world. So this is a company that is starting to sell this product that helps you find a purpose in an employment setting. And so this first piece just says, Compose your own purpose. And I say, okay, well, I have a personal purpose to enjoy love and beauty. I have this family purpose. And by the way, I can dictate into my phone now. That's kind of cool. Um, and if I don't know what my purpose is, I can get examples. And then once I put in all these pieces, it concatenates it all to form this purpose. Now, by the way, immediately then, I can start putting all these words that are collected from purposes and put them into a word cloud. And these are real words that are used at the University of Michigan with 103 people that we pilot tested this with a few months ago. So you can see how different these words are. Look at the work purposes people use, inspire, best, learn, create, make, cool. That's so neat. Notice that these are aspirational words. People, we don't see suck in there, <laughs> right? Now that's okay. We actually like that. We want people to be aspirational in their purposes because that's a goal that you're setting. It's a goal, though, that you deeply value. Obviously, these, you know, things like being best, learning, those are things that these individuals deeply value. But you can see how different they are from other words in other domains. Your family purpose. Look at that. Love, support, children, husband, raise. Wow, that's what you deeply value, and you've just operationalized that value into a purpose. I'm trying to demystify the concept of purpose so you don't feel like you need to live in a cave and meditate in a cave for six months in India. You know, I mean, I think that's awesome, by the way, but I don't think that that's what most people are going to do. So every single day, I can then, in fact, today, it just said, what was your day? Oh, very energetic. Now, this wasn't actually today, but this is last week. It said, OK, yeah, on fire. Didn't have a lot of willpower. Ate too many baby back ribs. Um, I didn't sleep well. I was very present. I meditated, so I get an alcoholic beverage. And uh, I exercised. That was good. The dotted line is what I had done the day before. And I was creative. And I ate like crap. And then every single day, it says, well, how closely aligned are you with your personal purpose? Very aligned. I take my finger, oh, very aligned with my family. Was I aligned with work? Yeah, not so much at all, actually. So I wasn't really aligned with work. I was, you know, with my family a lot. And was I aligned with my community? Well, yeah, um, not so much. So then I might get back from vacation or some break, and I say, oh, my God, now I have 5,000 email messages. I'm super aligned with my work the next day. So you see how this varies. We monitor all of this. And then every single day, you get this thing called a navigator, which tells you visually, ah, do you have wind in your sails? Do you have willpower? Do you have your rudder in the water or outside? Is your purpose close to you? How did things go that day? You know, is the water wavy and horrible? And is there rain? Is there thunder? All of that changes depending on what you were doing that day. And I'm not going to go through this whole app at all, but one important piece that really is part of the future of well-being programs is what I call precision well-being. We talk a lot about precision medicine. What does precision medicine mean? What that means is that you're moving from population-based medicine where if all of you were hypertensives, I'd give all of you exactly the same drug and probably actually pretty close to the same dose. Well, that doesn't work very well, does it? It works for a mean. Who is a mean anywhere? Anyone perfectly average in here? 
I don't think so. So, you know, since you're not, we would want to learn more about you. And based on you, we would dose that drug properly and maybe not even give you that drug. So that's what precision well-being is moving toward. How can we do this at an individual level? In psychology, we'd call that a within-person model as opposed to a between-person population model. So we can look at your space, sleep, presence, activity, creativity, and eating every day. But also, since you have a smartphone and we're doing this, or the web, we know where you live and we know what day it is. So we know the day of the week. By the way, at the University of Michigan, do not initiate anything with our staff on a Thursday because energy and willpower are like unbelievably low. They start going down, 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 boom, on Thursday. And then it goes back to Friday, sweet. It's amazing. And then replenishing on the weekend. That's so cool. So you can know that from this app. So anyway, we, the day of the week, the day of the month, the end of the month, turns out not so good. Why? Anyone know? Low energy, low willpower, end of the month. Why, on average? Paying bills, who said that? Oh my gosh, are you smart? That's, that's exactly right. So, uh, but on average, gas prices, in other words, the economy. When gas prices are low, people are more likely who smoke to call a quit line. When they are high, they stop calling the quit line. How about sports events? When your NFL football team loses on a Sunday, on a Monday, and this is a big study done by a marketing group in France, actually. They came here, looked at all the NFL communities. Your NFL team loses on a Sunday, that community eats 16% more saturated fat on a Monday. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think we deserve a class action lawsuit against the Detroit Lions. <laughs> it's like eating 16 Whoppers, you know? Just like, it's insane. So if they win, you eat 9% less saturated fat. Thank God, Jim Harbaugh, you know? I mean, so I've, I've talked to him and said, you know, you're making us thinner. He said, oh, well, I didn't know it. Um, <laughs> Just into winning. Uh, humidity, look at this. We know you're, you know whether it's raining outside, right? When it's raining, we're less likely to walk to work or be ac active, things like that. When it's snowing, we eat comfort food, we eat meatloaf, right? So all of those things are different. But they're different for different people. They're different from you, than you, than you, than you. Um, also, we can connect this with 150 biometric devices. Why not? Connect it with fuel bands and Fitbits and glucometers and, and blood pressure cuffs and everything else. Why not be able to connect this? And then most important, connect it with your fellow human beings, your significant others. What if you could go to a coworker who you really appreciate and say, I'd love to share my purpose with you. Chris, I'd love to share my purpose with you. Would you like to do that with me? And you might say, no. Or you might go, wow, that's awesome. I'd actually like to do that too. And, and then I'd like to share my energy and willpower every day. So if I'm acting kind of nasty today, you at least know that I didn't sleep well last night. You know, you know my space. That might be kind of cool. So do you want to share? Imagine this as something you might only give to three, four, five people in your whole life, like your mom or your daughter or your spouse, whoever, but a coworker you care about a lot, those people. And so imagine this almost like Facebook, only without the 99% of people who really are not your friends. <laughs> I think that would be kind of cool. So that's part of this app. The important part in a personal model, this is one individual's data for 10 days. Each dot is a day of observation on how well this person slept. I'm just simplifying the whole thing. So how well they slept versus how much energy they had. And you see little dots everywhere. Now, the st statisticians in this room or anybody who's into, you know, statistics might say, okay, I see a little regression line going there. Or maybe the sleep against willpower. Yeah, I see a little regression line, and that would be the actual regression line. So the red is how it relates to willpower, how sleep relates. As, as I'm starting to sleep better, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm uh, getting a little more willpower, I'm getting a little more energy. But starting to take into account all of these things, and then getting real predictive modely about this, like starting to really, um, you know, develop some very advanced modeling, such as neural networking, you start being able to build a more advanced model. So in other words, as this person, this is one individual's real data, so as they're starting to sleep to a moderate level, I start then seeing a big uptick in my energy. As I start sleeping a little bit better, I start seeing a big uptick in my willpower, and then if I sleep too much, I see this downturn. And population studies show that, but after 10 days, your personal model shows this. 
People's personal models, we've discovered, uh, can be detected between eight and 10 days, and they start predicting more variation than the population model by that time. That was something we spent a whole year analyzing and figuring out how long does it take to move from the population model, the between person model, to the within person model, the model of you personally. That makes sense so far? Now, how do we show this to an individual? Well, we do it this way. We say, if you put your finger on the red S, you can move that up and down, and these bars go up and down, and you can look at what max, how much sleep is required to maximize your energy and maximize your willpower, and then you can set a target around that. You can set a goal. Now, the other thing that we found is in our pre-testing through last summer and fall is that after about 15 days or so, they said, okay, I know what makes me tick. By the way, you can slide that part that says sleep up there and say, I want to look at the day of the week and how that influences me. I want to look at how humidity influences me. I want to look at presence. You can look at all those things and be a better researcher of yourself. Socrates once said, of course, the unexamined life is not worth living. We want to help you examine your life. But Aristotle, the philosophical grandson of, of Socrates, said essentially, the purpose of life is not even worth examining in the first place. So we want to do two things. This is kind of a yin-yang. We want to help you build purpose, but then examine that purposeful life so that you can live an even more fulfilled, purposeful, aligned life. Does that make sense? So one of the things we found is as people started learning about their energy and willpower, they started substituting energy or willpower ratings every day for what they cared about every day, such as their migraines or their depression level, or if you had MS, their MS flare-ups, or many other things, their relationship with their spouse, or even their golf game. And why not? All this is is a massive predictive model. So we said, oh, good, add two new wildcard variables. It's not unlike if you have a park and everybody is walking, whoops, and tripping over the park, and, and they're walking through the grass, and then... Uh, and you say, okay, we should just like create a sidewalk there. So we did that. We just said, let's build a sidewalk here and offer two wild card outcomes. Now, then once you have done this, then every day after 15 days, you can get essentially a weather report of yourself. So you can say, and I do this every day now. I, every day anyway, I've always opened my iPhone and said, what's the weather going to be like? Because I have to walk to work. Well, it's going to rain. Okay, I'll wear a raincoat. Fine. So I know what the prediction is, and then I try to prepare for that prediction. We can say, wow, Vic, you're supposed to have low energy today. Why do you think I'm supposed to have low energy today, Mr. Computer? Because in your personal model, we know that you haven't been sleeping well lately, and that's important to you. We know that's important to you. It may not be important to you, but it's important to me in my personal model. And it's supposed to rain. What can I do about this? And Jewel then says, well, of your personal model, of all the things you can do something about, we'd recommend being more present today. What do you mean by presence? I don't know what that means. So I click that and I say, well, and it says, well, here's a presence tip. So it brings up, it pulls up a tip for me. If I don't like that one, I can pull up another one. Very importantly, every day, as I said, we find out how aligned you are with your personal, family, work, and community purposes. And you can see where you could be very aligned with your family, or very misaligned with your family, very aligned with work, very misaligned with work. One of the things we wanted to find out in all of our pilot testing, now we've pilot tested with over 300 people, but we wanted to find out what are the, do these purposes vary in individuals? You know, in other words, when you really are aligned with work, are you really misaligned with family, for example? So we ran what's called a principal components analysis. And here's the visual representation of that principal components analysis. My boat, when I am really sailing toward this work harbor, it turns out I'm not sailing toward my family harbor, typically. And this isn't just me. This is on a population level. So we've been looking at alignment and differences in alignment and misalignment. So these two things in a principal components analysis are the furthest apart. When I'm aligned with family, I tend not to be aligned with work and vice versa. Does that make sense? In the middle are these two pieces, community and personal. So they're kind of in between, but the two real juxtapositions are family and work. Now, any psychologist or business person in here is going, duh, Vic, you just discovered the obvious. Well, that's fine, but we wanted to discover the obvious, and we want to do it at an individual level. 
So we also wanted to look at what relates to misalignment and alignment. So we looked at work family misalignment, which might look like this. My family is totally, I'm not aligned with it, but my anchor is, su oh, I'm sorry, this is total misalignment. I'm not aligned with family and I'm not aligned with work. Two is work over family. I'm really aligned with work, but I'm really not aligned with family. Can you see that visually? Okay, family over work. So I'm just, I'm not, I'm ignoring personal and community for right now. I'm just focusing on these two very juxtaposed pieces. Um, family over work. And then ideally you have family and work alignment. And of course, as I just showed, we look at energy and willpower every day as well. So one of the things we wanted to find out is is energy and our energy and willpower related to these things? And here's what we found. So I'll go through this pretty carefully. The energy ratings on the y on the x-axis, as you move further to the right, you have more energy. Okay? And as you have more energy, you're more likely to have work family alignment and less likely to have work family misalignment. Does this make sense? As you have little energy you see that there's less work-family alignment. The same holds for willpower. So what this is doing is, is starting to validate what we're trying to do, our conceptual framework for what we're doing. Now, um, in addition to this, we have something called Joule Vibe. Joule Vibe is essentially the Joule app only for the organization, at the organization level. And of course, we don't give individuals data back to an HR person or a benefits manager or wellness coordinator. We don't do that because no company does that. What we want to do is deliver this back in an anonymized population level. Joule Vibe doesn't open up until you have 100 people using it. So that allows us to anonymize. But it also allows the person in the morning to say, wow, energy is supposed to be low today, or willpower is supposed to be low today, or high today, or man, the alignment um, is really bad. My work, the work alignment in our organization. Let's look at sales. Let's look at engineering. Let's look at uh, accounting. Oh, yeah, it's April 10th. Yeah, we're super misaligned right now. So that sort of thing. You can start looking at those basic vibes the pulse of your company every single day. And this is a dynamic piece. So a big question is, can we really build a purpose pill? You might be saying, Vic, I know that purpose is related to all these things, but you can't change purpose. Well, this is what we found. At the University of Michigan, we did a pre-test and post-test with 41 people, gave everybody the app, and we, it didn't matter whether they used the app. We just took all comers, whether and how much they use the app. And by the way, they used it a lot. They use it three times more than any other wellness app um, on average. So one of the things that we found is that pre-test, 37% of people felt that they were aligned with their purpose. At post-test, 63% felt that they were aligned with their purpose. So we close to doubled purpose in life. And that was good. So at least we're saying, okay, we have a purpose pill. Now, how does alignment relate to things such as depression? So we measured depression at pre-test and post-test two months later, and we found this significant decrease in depression as purpose alignment increased. So this word is really important, not just for you guys, but for us in a school of public health. Does that make sense? We really want to reduce depression, and very importantly, we want to increase vitality. Vitality relates to productivity and all that, right? So those are all important. So um, Emil Durkheim, said a couple of interesting things in those quotes before. One is, he talked about the relationship between themselves, the relations between themselves. How are employees working together? As I built Jewel, the company, we went to the Argus building. I don't know if you know where that is, but it's where WUOM, our public radio station is. Go up to the fourth floor. It's where they made Argus cameras uh, through the whole last century, practically. And we went up to the fourth floor. It was owned by the university. It was all in cubicles. And all the big, you know, the, the, the big honchos, they all had offices with closed doors and drywall so you couldn't see in who was working there. All in the outskirts, all around. And inside, the interior had cubicles for all the people who were working for those executives. And I said, let's take this and destroy it. Let's just tear the whole thing apart. So we worked with um, Steelcase. And without Paul Jones, where's Paul? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Without Paul Jones, we wouldn't have built Jewel the way we did it all. So Paul introduced himself to me at one of these conferences, a positive or a conference, and he said, you should come out to Steelcase. I said, great, can I meet your designers? And they said, wow, awesome. So the designers took a look at this space and said, wow, let's have everybody work in the middle. 
rather than on the outside. And let's turn all these offices into meeting rooms. So this is what they started designing for us. And Steelcase did this. They just, this is all 3D work that they did. So I could really visualize how this would be. Said, let's put in these kind of cool lamps and you know, kind of make this look like a campfire. Let's have these buoy chairs where you can pop around. And, and said, wow, I, I think we'll like that. Yeah, let's try that. Um, let's have each of these rooms with different personalities, whether it's a video con room or a lounge or a meditation room. Meditation and nap room. I want a meditation and nap room. Because if you nap for a minute, you replace, you can replenish up to five minutes of sleep deprivation. So that's important. I wanted that. I wanted people napping. I wanted people meditating. And then, of course, the classic boardroom. So we just tore the crap out of this whole space. Just gutted it. And, um, and started putting in these glass walls rather than standard you know, drywall, because we wanted to see who was working where. Even in the meditation and nap room, I wanted, you know, I just wanted to see what was going on. So here's what Jewel Health looks like now. Jewel, this is a stand-up. We have stand-ups every morning. So what are you going to be doing today? Well, here's what I'm going to be doing today. How, what are you going to be doing today? Here's what I'm going to be doing. Imagine if you're trying to build your kitchen that way, how much faster and more efficient you would do it if the electrician and plumber and, and drywall person and framer all got together and said, here's what I'm going to do. Because you know what? This person, the customer, just she decided or he decided they want to move the sink over here. Wow, okay, I can help with that. I can rebuild that. I'll drop what I'm doing and work with you. You would get things done much faster. That's called Agile. Agile development turns out, in general, to work much better, and it's how modern software is built. So that's how we do it. Every morning we have a stand-up. And then we work collaboratively in the middle. Notice the people like looking over the shoulder of somebody else. This woman is our chief technology officer in the back. She works really closely with our software engineers. This is an intern in the middle working really closely with two software engineers. Awesome. Um, software engineer himself, but if we need to meet privately, we can. If we want to take a phone call, if we want to go ahead and produce things, we can go to this space. We can start working together. We can start building out uh, new ideas. We have whiteboards everywhere. We teach people how to meditate. So everybody has learned how to meditate now. Not everybody meditates, but it's awesome when they do. It's really great. And then we have this meditation room. This is Uncle Lenny, he is our chief energy officer. He's also my Jack Russell Terry. He is a total batshit dog. Every single day, my wife and I say, why did we get a Jack Russell Terrier? But you know, Uncle Lenny is the coolest dog and he, everybody loves him. Now also, we encourage, you know, there's snow days and things like that. A lot of our software engineers go, wow, I might have to like not come in. I said, no, bring the kids in, that's no problem. Uncle Lenny will take care of them. And they do. So this company is very, very hands-on. It's very interactive. You notice through some of those pictures that people were really working with each other in a very different way. So yeah, you notice the pause on piece too. Yeah, so this is part of our website. Um, the other thing though that's important as I start concluding is Durkheim said, and the group to which we belong. It's not just the relationships among the employees, but it's also the purpose and mission, the group to which they're connected to. So purpose is the point here. And I want to show you, if you don't mind, a five-minute video with a person named Seku Andrews, who's a good friend of mine, and uh, he is a two-time National Poetry Slam spoken word winner in the country. Uh, and he took the app. And I'm not describing the whole app, I just said, Seku, why don't you take the app? And he started using it for a few weeks, and then he took a flight from Los Angeles, where he lives, to Detroit. And in that five-hour time, he wrote this five-minute poem. And I'd like to share this poem with you, if I could. Aristotle often spoke of the idea that we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Power in that notion is that it pulls the philosophy from our minds and puts it in our muscles. And I would go a step further. If excellence is the destination and habits are the vehicle, then the engine that makes it drive is the unearthing of our why, purpose. And not the philosophy of purpose, like some theory learned in school with no idea how it shows up in our lives. No, the science of sustainable excellence is found in purpose applied. 
for it's how we live the theory that gives purpose its feet. Putting purpose into practice puts the quantum in my leap. Making sure the reasons behind the life well lived are served is what can turn my wellness from a noun into a verb. Because health means well. And wellness is certainly well-meaning, but only purpose has the means to get me to well-being. Like how sometimes my wife's kiss on my right cheek is all the sugar I need to remind me to cut the sweets that would cause diabetes. The energy that I exchange with the meaningful people who matter most is the chemistry that converts that meaning to matter, the accountability that makes all my excuses scatter, the value-driven choices that are based on my patterns. There are friends to whom I only listen because I know they know me. They know all my good and bad habits. They know my history. There are journals with my entries that I revisit and read just to learn which days I've grown out of which days I repeat. There are weather forecasts that I call upon just to see what to wear to make today the best that it can be. These daily incremental gains fan the incremotional flames, making incrememorable moments that help my behavior change. With this tool, designed on purpose to literally analyze yesterday's history, to decode tomorrow's mystery, and give today more victories. It is possibility in a pocket. It's purpose in a purse. It doesn't show me the finish line without showing the steps first. That first step that gets me off the couch to go run with the life I'm running toward, not the death I'm running from. It's less of a health risk assessment or a wellness checklist and more like a data detective that aggregates biometrics and other patterns detected like which days are most hectic and which triggers make you aggressive like i noticed that monday work pressures plus gas prices leave your mood affected and on mortgage days you're less rested and your energy is a mess but every week that you invested time for hobbies you were more present and scheduling social events keep you from feeling disconnected so here are some impressive community suggestions from health experts and others who perfected the selection of habits most effective and habits to be rejected, anchored by the core values you selected to leave your course corrected. But of course, before we get reckless and try to tackle your whole life objective, how about we put your excellence directive in a bit of perspective and start with just giving you the will today to eat a smart breakfast. Every healthy habit teaches me to give myself the space I need to serenade my holistic balance in four-part harmony, personal and community, work and home. This is what the word purpose looks like when it's owned. Less of a precious stone that gives your life bling and more of a jewel that beautifies your well-being, makes you shine bright like a forecast that sings of how you survived winter and gave your life spring by pressing finger to screen and literally tapping into the power of that friend who knows who you are, the journal that tracks where you've been, the forecast that shows where you're headed, the habits that lead to the win. See, it's not about what Aristotle said eons ago, but what Aristotle says today about your history that helps you habitually keep your purpose in play, gives the boat that is your body the needed navigation to sail through uncharted waters to your life's aspiration, and you can't sail into your sunset without the sun's navigation. So this is the light that guides journey to destination. This is the map and engine that drives your intrinsic motivation. This is the act of well-being. It's daily activation. Purpose is the point that gives your life exclamation. And this is more than just the theory of purpose. This is the application. So this is the point for our company. That is our purpose, to help one billion people reach a purpose in their lives. And uh, we are a positive organization. Uh, I just finished a book related to purpose in life called Life on Purpose, and that will be sold out here. It just came out on Tuesday. That was the release date. So today is two days after the release date, and I hope each of you buys 300 of them. So, <laughs> and the other thing I just wanted to leave you with is, if you're intrigued by the app at all, um, you can get it for your smartphone today. 
So you can sign up for it if you want to write that down. Uh, you know, we can, we can share this in other ways, I'm sure. But we just wanted to let you know, jewelapp.com, that's easy, slash umpawsorg. And uh, if you do want to sign up and try it, uh, love to have you do that. Thank you very much. Wow. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. What amazing, isn't it? I mean, he went through so many different ideas. I hope you were taking notes. My, my notes is already filling up. Uh, <clears throat> really, I mean, um, what Lynn started out as laying the vision for a positive business about economic value, creating great places to work and great neighbors, etc. what Vic has shown us really about how He's given us a lot of ideas about how to fuel this, this engine, and keep it running. I mean, as he was talking, I'm trying to see different ways to describe this stuff, and there are, it's very hard. But a few things that I picked up, you know, how do you make purpose not just an act, but a habit? But really, how we talk about, I'm, I'm in technology and operations, we talk about big data, social media, et cetera, for lots of different things. But how do you take this whole big data approach for purpose and actually own it? In some sense, what he's developed is a global purpose system, the GPS for life, right? That's what he's developed. And so it's really, really fascinating. So thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing these ideas with us. Uh, <clears throat> as we transition now, we want to learn about the basic building blocks of positive business. So in a sequence of talks uh, from faculty, we will show you, walk you through how to create the great places to work, whether it does really matter that you would create these great places to work. And even if I showed you that it does matter, how would you make those hard decisions? So those are the sequence of three talks we'll go through. And I would like to first introduce you to uh, Jane Dutton, my colleague from Michigan Ross. She's a world expert on flourishing. <clears throat> and she's going to step up here to outline her plan about how you can create a great workplace. Please join me in welcoming Jane to the stage. Okay, testing, can you hear me? Vic, that was fabulous. And the whole time I was worried that you were gonna trip again, so I'm gonna just make sure this, this goes down. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. So many people I care about in the room, but I really care about positive business. And uh, it's my honor to talk to you about uh, a simple idea. Uh, it's, I'm, what I'm gonna try to do in my talk is to give you a slightly different angle um, on thinking about great places to work by highlighting this idea of a flourishing triangle. Okay, so let me make sure this works. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the wrong clicker. That oh, wrong clicker. this clicker. Thank you. Yes. So what I'm gonna start with is a core assumption that in great places to work, people cultivate flourishing in the everyday. Now, what do I mean by that? If we could look through a keyhole and looked at what was going on in an organization, and we saw how people came together, we saw how people greeted each other, we saw how people worked together, we would see that those everyday conditions were making a difference in people's flourishing. Now, the question you might ask is, what do we mean by flourishing? By flourishing, I mean people are in a condition of optimal human functioning. They're most alive. When, as a researcher, if I were trying to measure flourishing, I might try to measure um, an individual's well-being. I might try to measure how engaged, energetic, helpful, resilient, persistent, and effective they are. These are all indicators that an individual is in a state of optimal human functioning. When people are flourishing at work, they say things like, I feel like I'm growing into a better version of myself by working here. Or I love what I'm doing. I really care about the people here. Or finally, we do amazing work here, and it's work that really makes a difference. 
Now, I'm an organizational researcher, and that means I've studied lots of different organizations. These are just some of the organizations I've spent time in or written about. And that organizational lens is, is really, has been really important in terms of giving me different reasons that I think we should care about people flourishing at work. The first reason to care is that people deserve to flourish at work. If we don't even think about what flourishing does, just in and of itself, all human beings deserve well-being. They deserve to prosper at work. However, there's a second reason to care. The reason to care, second reason to care is that people are at work are settling for surviving. They are definitely not thriving. And let me give you just one anecdote from my experience teaching. I teach an MBA elective. It has about uh, 60 people in it on managing professional relationships. And those people, those students in that class have a choice about what kind of learning log they want to write about from their experience at work. For the last three years, over 50% of the people in that class have written about um, experiences of, of toxicity at work. And their accounts are so vivid that I can only read three or four of them without getting up and writing around, when walking around, because again, the, their accounts are so disturbing. So people are settling for si surviving and they're putting up with toxic workplaces. They're definitely not thriving. Um, and the third reason to care is, you know, I'm a business school professor, and Gretchen and I, um, in our book on positive leadership, uh, learned to try to make a case for why we should compare flourishing at work, or why should we ca should care about flourishing at work, and that's because it fosters sustained organizational effectiveness. And let me just give you an image to, to capture that. Let's imagine, think about your work organization, the organization that you're part of, and we can think about on the y-axis, that organization is variable in terms of, at, over time, in terms of how effective it is. And let's just imagine, in 2016, you know, you're a little bit maybe lower than you want to, want to be, but you're moving up. You're moving up, you're getting better. The organization's becoming more effective along some metric that you care about. What we asked in our book, and what a flourishing lens, gets, I think, gets you to think about is, what if there's another line? What if the rate at which we could get better, in terms of the dimension of effectiveness that we could care about, we could get at it faster, and, um, well, I should say, we call that the zone of possibility. Um, and let's imagine that we could get to that higher line um, by unlocking resources from within the organization. So we could unlock the resources within an individual, within a relationship, within a team, or within the whole organization. And that's what flourishing does. So from a business case perspective, if we can get more people in an organization to be in a flourishing state, then we could increase the rate, we have more resources and more capacity uh, to be more effective. Now again, I mentioned I'm an organizational researcher, and that means I look through the lens, always, of organizational context. So I'm really interested in comparing context and what difference that makes for organizational flourishing. Uh, and if those of you who know me, I'm smiling in the audience because there's some people I know well here, know I love gardens. And I always love the metaphor of gardens. And one way to think about it is different organizational contexts create different types of soil for human flourishing. In some soil, People in that organization, and you can tell by the moment almost when you walk into that organization, are languishing. So they're in a garden, but the soil does not have enough nutrients for people to kind of be at their best. In contrast, in flourishing organizations, or in, in organizations that have really good soil, people really are flourishing. They're saying the kinds of things that um, those earlier quotations suggested, and they are moving towards a state of optimal functioning. So I'm going to argue, and here comes the triangle, uh, that there are three conditions that we can bet on that foster flourishing at work. Those are positive emotions, positive meanings, and positive connections. And that cool little zippy thing in the middle suggests, is meant to tell you that these are conditions that interact with each other and that accentuate each other. So those are meant to signify gears. So for example, if I define my work uh, as a calling, so I infuse it with positive meaning, it makes me feel differently. I'm li likely to be more excited about work, I'm likely to be more joyful at work, and those kinds of positive emotions 
actually change my stance with respect to other people and make it easier for me to uh, have positive connections. So they are conditions that typically uh, go together. Now what I want to do is just give you some defining elements of the flourishing triangle. So I want to define each of those pieces of the triangle, and then I'm going to give you some examples. So let's begin with positive emotions. Positive emotions, as those of you who are in this uh, positive organizational psychology space know, are really powerful. Barb Fredrickson has, has taught us a lot about the power of positive emotions. What do I mean? I mean pleasant feelings that are attached with an action tendency. So if, for example, if I feel the emotion of joy, the action, I may want to play. Or if I feel the emotion of interest, I may want to explore. And the research is really clear that just by feeling those kinds of things, whoops, whoops, it broadens our attention, whoops, let's see if we can make this, uh, and our attentional capacity, it builds resources like um, opt optimism and confidence and things like that that we carry forward into future situations. So positive em emotions can be really important in terms of resourcing people in the current, in the current situation and in situations moving forward. Positive meanings, what do I mean about positive meanings? I mean imbuing something with value, worth, or significance. And what's so cool and important about positive meanings when we're talking about organizations is that there are at least three sources of positive meaning that are, that are at work in organizations. One is the positive meaning about the self. So who do I think I am or believe myself to be in this organization? We can also make positive meaning about our work. I mentioned the example of calling. That's because seeing my work as a calling is an example of positive meaning about my work. And we can also think about the positive meaning associated with being an organizational member. Um, and again, ugh, again, the research suggests that uh, when we feel positive meaning, it actually increases capacities and capabilities by increasing people's motivation, their engagement, their creativity, their resilience, and their commitment. The final angle in the flourishing triangle is one of my favorites. Those of you who know, this is part of what I study, or this idea of high quality connections. So what do I mean by positive connections? I mean these short term connections that we have with other people, whoops, um, that are both mutual, so we feel a sense of mutuality, we feel a sense of energy or vitality, and we sense positive regard. So we see the other person. Both people see each other's with loving eyes or loving intentions. And again, we find that even these short-term interactions, these short-term connections that we have with people are really powerful. They're really resource producing. They increase people's health, uh, foster generosity, trust, optimism, resilience, and attachment. So if we put the flourishing triangle together, I think it's sort of easy to claim that when we have all three conditions together, again, they're interacting in ways and they are generative. Now, generative is also one of my favorite, most obscure words. Generative means, you know, it's resource producing. It's exuding capacity, building capability. So when I'm going to argue, the argument I'm going to make is that when organizations or workplaces are great, they have a mission. And they enact that mission through certain kinds of practices. And what I mean by practices are the everyday ways of doing things in the organization that become kind of habits. And I'm going to argue that those cultivate flourishing in part by, if they're cultivating flourishing, they're doing it in part by creating these conditions that I'm calling the flourishing triangle. But that's pretty obscure. Let's make it real with some examples. And I'm going to give you three. The first example is from LinkedIn, an organization that I'm growing to really love. And I'm growing to love it because I'm increasingly using it, but I'm also growing to love it because as I sort of peek inside the keyhole, as we've had students who go to work for LinkedIn, and I've been reading more and more about them, I really love the way that they uh, cultivate flourishing in the everyday. So they have a very ambitious goal or mission, uh, that they want to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. And in 2005, they only had 500 employees. Today, they have over 9,200 employees. So they've been in this experience of rapid growth, so they're constantly adding people. And so they're in this process, one of their every, almost everyday practice is selecting people. But what's interesting is 
that they select people partially for compassion. And uh, I believe that that is a, an example of an everyday practice that is, that is um, through how it's affecting the flourishing triangle, um, encouraging flourishing. Now let me unpack that for you. Oh, let, before I unpack it, I'm gonna actually give you the example. So Lindsay Reed, who is a, a MBA student of mine, was hired as a, as a LinkedIn intern. So this is an example of an interview question used to hire an intern, not even an employee. So put, imagine you're Lindsay, you've just come in to, to be interviewed. What uh, I ask is Ryan Stiles, the person who's interviewed, I say, pretend you are a business partner visiting Chicago from Mountain View for a very important meeting with top managers in the global sales organization. You step out of the meeting to use the restroom and one of your managers stops you on the way saying, one of my employees in California just had a baby. The infant is in the ICU at a hospital that's an hour away from her home. Is there anything we can do to help her? Now, for those of you who haven't done a business-like interview uh, for an intern, this is not your typical interview, <laughs> interview question. And in fact, it's what Ryan calls a gray zone question. It's sort of like a Rorschach. It's an ambiguous gray event in which the, the interviewee is sort of looking at the kinds of values that the person starts to talk about in assessing what to do in this situation. And what they're looking for is the prominence of the value of compassion, uh, the value of care, and evidence that in fact someone was showing compassion. Well, how does that LinkedIn selection practice work to foster flourishing? I would argue that on the positive emotion side is cultivating empathy and a sense of gratitude, not just on the part of Lindsay for being asked this question, but Ryan and all the people participating in that selection process that way are likely to feel those kinds of positive emotions. Those in turn signal that LinkedIn really cares uh, and that each person is unique. So this person had a situation with a, a daughter that was in the ICU, but you know everybody has circumstances that um, in which they would like to be treated as as special and unique. And that those positive meanings, along with the positive emotions, you know cultivate uh, a, a higher probability of people forming these positive connections because people get good at and people are selected for being good at perspective taking, which builds. Trust. Trust. So that's my first example of an everyday practice that uh, creates flir the flourishing triangle, the conditions that again generates uh, flourishing. Let me give you a second example. This is an example of a, of a family-owned firm uh, in Michigan called Block Imaging. They have uh, a very noble goal. They extend the life of medical imaging equipment so that healthcare providers worldwide can extend the lives of people. Now this organization is not growing at the same rate uh, as LinkedIn, but it has the practice, like most organizations, of onboarding people. And those onboarding practices can make a real difference in terms of, again, cultivating the conditions for flourishing. So my argument is that the way that they welcome newcomers um, during onboarding, again, because of what it does to the flourishing triangle, increases the capacity for flourishing. And so again, let me give you the example. This is an example of uh, an email sent out by a block imaging team from the human resource department when a new member of the marketing team was joining the organization. So I'm only gonna give you part of the memo, but imagine, put yourself as a member of block imaging uh, in, in the shoes and see what you would think getting this memo. So what rhymes with simile fandalance and is a big announcement? That's right. Emily Sandilands, please help me welcome our new marketing campaign manager. Emily's experience and passion for content marketing, company culture, and customer experience is a very exciting addition to our block imaging team. She'll be a key player in helping bridge more of everyone's ideas, to bring, bringing everyone's life ideas to life faster as we all strive to build brand awareness and grow our impact in the healthcare industry. While her picture may be in black and white attached, I'm sure you'll find out quickly that she's actually quite colorful. Below are a few more details Emily was willing to share about herself. Now, you know, again, remember, just think, you could, there are all kinds of welcoming memos that you could send out. In fact, a lot of organizations don't even send out welcoming memos. <laughs> but what is it about this particular, you know, uh, memo, again, an email communication that creates 
on an everyday basis a capacity for flourishing. Uh, I would suggest, that again, going back to our really simple model, that this, this kind, getting this kind of email or being uh, Emily Sandilands, the person who's sort of uh, um, highlighted in this email, prompts a sense of appreciation, a sense of excitement. Who is this Emily Sand Sandilands anyway? And curiosity. Those are all positive emotions. They're associated with seeing employees as valuable contributors. So before Emily even gets on board, at block imaging, she's already constru being construed as a, con a valuable contributor. And again, what's important in organizations, this is not just about Emily. Every person who witnesses this kind of a welcoming routine is reminded that they, they themselves are special and a, and a contributor. And that, in turn, uh, cultivates the soil, so there's more positive connections. So it generates motivation. I'd want to meet Emily if I got that email. Um, it, it sort of predisposes me to like Emily and perhaps want to help her. So that's another example of, again, in an early part of the process, and my students know uh, first moments matter. So these, what you do in the beginnings of these processes are really important. Again, it's tilling the soil for, uh, for flourishing. My last example, is also an example from a, um, a Michigan headquartered company, Herman Miller. Uh, and Herman Miller is a furniture, we've got a lot of really good uh, furniture uh, pr producing companies uh, in Michigan. Uh, but their explicit mission is we create inspiring designs to help people do great things. And I'm going to argue that the way that they give gifts uh, to customers and visitors, uh, it cultivates these flourishing conditions. Um, and produces flourishing. And I brought a show and tell to show you this. So I am a teacher of MAP, that's Multidisciplinary Action Projects, teaching that we do with our MBA students where they go into all these companies their last seven weeks of their first year. And this was my first year that I went to Herman Miller. Um, and uh, you know, when you go as a faculty member to, uh, to support your teams, they often give you stuff. Uh, and lots of times it's standard stuff. You know, the, the cup, the pen, you know, the, they're sort of the standard kinds of things. This was not so standard. So this was what they gave me. It's actually a beautiful laptop protector. And what you might notice is it's, it's made of this upholstery type fabric, uh, which Herman Miller makes some, some of their furniture as upholstery design. And as they came to explain it to me, um, this is uh, part of, uh, this is the outcome of one of their initiatives that came out from their foundation. They have Herman Miller Cares Foundation. Uh, unlike most foundations, all of the money that's given out by that Herman Miller Cares is given out by uh, employee groups. There's uh, employee groups that actually determine uh, what kind of foundation donations are given, and one employee two or three years ago, got involved with an organization called the Gift of Hope in Haiti, which is an organization that uh, supports women who are raising single moms raising kids. And it provides both sewing uh, instruction, but also uh, fabric. And so that they can sell these kinds of things that, uh, that um, support this particular cause. So that's an example of taking an everyday practice, giving a gift, to a visitor or a customer in ways that I think, again, creates these conditions for flourishing. So at the um, emotional level, I, mean, I was joyful to get this. I was appreciative to get this. I mean, I learned about the woman who had sewn this. It's kind of like if you buy things at Whole Foods, they have the same kind of, same kind of um, products that you could buy. But to get this as a gift was particularly meaningful. Uh, and I think as I watched the Herman Miller employees give it to me, they were also excited and felt quite joyful, I think, that I, you know, as I opened it up. It was not your regular giving of a gift, uh, you know, just as a, an everyday visitor. I think it helped peop people who are at Herman Miller see themselves as contributors, and the organization is doing good in the world. They have lots of visitors, they have lots of customers, they're doing this all the time. And it motivated generosity and created a sense of community, not just the community amongst Herman and Miller, but the community between Herman and Miller employees and, and uh, the, the women in Haiti that this uh, product was helping. Uh, so I think that, uh, that that's a, also a wonderful uh, example of an everyday practice uh, that makes a difference. So as I leave you, let me uh, make two invitations to you as you sort of travel through this conference. 
Uh, the first invitation is to ask and understand why these practices that we keep calling out in positive business, how do they work? How do they function? Why do they make a difference? Uh, and I think what, um, what I also want to encourage you is to think about everyday practices. How can small things that we do in every day in our work organizations be repurposed, reframed, redone, realigned in ways that make it more likely that we can cultivate these positive conditions, these conditions for flourishing? And um, I, oh, I want you to notice this. I want us to go from languishing gardens to flourishing gardens. <laughs> And I, you know, I want us to think about these three conditions together, positive emotions, positive meaning, positive connections. Um, and as we do that, maybe we can challenge our imagination to invent in big and small ways organizational practices and ways that cultivate sustained human flourishing. So thank you.